Hey everyone, this is lecture number seven, our last content lecture for Remix Music, Art, and Culture. Uh, this week, week number seven, uh, you are to read Reality Hunger by David Shields. Uh, your post is going to be a proposal for your Remix project uh, and to do your discussion as usual. Uh, and again, I want to remind you that your final project, your Remix, is going to be due uh, not this uh, upcoming Sunday, but the Sunday after the 13th. But uh, I want to, I'll bring it up now and I'll give you the prompt for it now because I want you to start collecting materials as soon as you can because it's going to take a while to find stuff. So again, your assignments this week by Friday at 10 p.m. You're going to post a proposal for your Remix project. Sunday by 10, your usual discussion. And then next week is going to be a project work week. There's no new content. There's no discussion. There's no discussion posts. There's just uh, an opportunity to work on your project. It's going to take a while. Uh, so I want to give you plenty of time to do that. Uh, I'll also be available. Uh, for consultation and uh, real-time chats and things like that if you, uh, if you need it. Uh, so we'll talk about that, uh, well, next week, actually. The reading this week is David Shields' Reality Hunger. Uh, I picked this because, uh, as it, this is an English class, it seemed appropriate to end uh, with a discussion about how remix is, a pro is relevant to contemporary literary practice. Uh, he's going to be concerned about you know, the state of literature now, and he thinks Remix is really uh, valuable in thinking about that. He also exemplifies his theory uh, or uh, you know, performs uh, what he's arguing uh, through his book. He uh, has sampled uh, a couple hundred sources to produce this, uh, and he doesn't footnote it as he goes through. He has a list at the end, uh, but he tells you to, to cut that out of the book. Uh, so his is, his is a kind of, uh, he calls it a literary montage. It's a call to arms, a manifesto. So he's, he's trying to start a kind of literary movement of what he calls reality-based artists. And as you move into a period in which you're going to be writing, making a remix, again, that seems kind of appropriate. Uh, and finally, it's going to provide an archive of material for you. As you're searching for things to include in your remix, you might go to Reality Hunger's set of things that it's been quoting. Uh, I'd like you to read at least through the chapter that's named El Collage, uh, and that chapter ends on page 125. The rest of the book, I think, is still interesting, but it gets really specific to literature and literary genre and has less to do with the topics of our course. Uh, if you want to read it, please do, but if you're trying to save some time, you can stop around uh, stop at page 125. So I'm going to run through a selection of uh, quotations that I'm taking out that I think streamline his argument somewhat. Uh, I also thought it was kind of relevant and appropriate to uh, do a kind of sampling of this work as a way to explain how it functions. And so he begins uh, with a history of mimesis or a history of representational art. Well, I mean, where he really begins is with the birth of writing in uh, 3200 BC. And then it shows us that as early as 450 BC, people were already talking about sampling or uh, plagiarizing from previous artists as uh, the foundation of art. So one author pilfers the best of another and calls it tradition. In 200 BC, they're already claiming that there's nothing, nothing left to say or there's no new art to make. So in section 27 or, or snippet 27 or whatever you want to call it, when they were published, the books that are now the canon of Western literature, the Iliad and the Bible, were understood to be true accounts of actual events. So secure was the preference for truth that Philip Sidney had to fight in the defense of poetry for the right to lie in literature at all. As recently as the, in 34, as recently as the late 18th century, landscape paintings were commonly thought of as a species of journalism. Real art meant pictures of allegorical or biblical subjects. A landscape was a mere record uh, or report. He's going to set this as the kind of beginning stage where art, style, or tradition uh, was previously thought of as representational in a kind of mimetic or reporting kind of way, a kind of recording of what had happened. And this would go through a transition in the late 1800, or the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century. So in the second half of the 19th century, several technologies emerged. Uh, for the first time, not only did our neighbors... So these technologies are going to be obviously uh, photography, uh, cinema, things like that. It's general effects of industrialization as, as they affect the art world. So for the first time, not only did your neighbors read the same news, 
you read in the morning and know the same music and movies, but across the country, but people across the country did too. Broadcast media, first radio, then television, homogenized culture even more. TV defined the mainstream. The power of electromagnetic waves is all is that they spread in all directions, essentially for free. And then in 45, after Freud, after Einstein, the novel retreated from narrative, poetry retreated from rhyme, and art retreated from the representational to the abstract. And though he doesn't explicitly state it here in any of these passages, he seems to set these as events uh, that are related to one another. So the age of representational art pretty much brought to the end by uh, massively by mass culture that was introduced in the industrial area, but industrial era era by uh, the easy reproducibility of uh, all kinds of media. So uh, because uh, we're really good at printing newspapers, uh, copying photos, we invent broadcast media such as radio and television. And there seems to be a correlation between that creation of, of uh, mass media, mass reproducible media, and the shift to abstract art as opposed to representational art. And then he, he moves it pretty quickly to the contemporary period and uh, writing about what is the task of the uh, artist or the, specifically the writer in, in the contemporary period after there's been this long uh, era of mass reproducible uh, art objects or mass re mass massively reproducible culture. So in 49, he says, the American writer has his hands full trying to understand and describe and then make credible much of the American reality. It stupefies, it sickens, it infuriates, and finally, it's even a kind of embarrassment to one's own meager imagination. The actuality is continually outdoing our talents and culture tosses up f figures almost daily that are the envy of most no of any novelist. I, I think this makes me think of TMZ uh, and TMZ news, but that's another issue. Uh, four and 51, he says, the lifespan of a fact is shrinking. I don't think there's time to save it. It used to be that a fact would last as long as its people, as long as kingdoms stood or legacies lived or myths endured their, set, their skeptics. But now facts have begun to dwindle and to the length of a generation, to the lifespans and memories of wars and plagues and depressions. We, we might think that that's, it's dwindling even more in the age of Twitter where facts are presented and then rebuffed almost immediately. So once we were the center of a vast but known universe, uh, now we're just, spec, just a speck in a vast and chaotic jumble. Shields then joins this to uh, the way uh, literature started to understand uh, reality and represent reality. And so he says in 54, plot is a way to stage dramatize reality, uh, but when presentation is too obviously formulaic, it's, as it often is, the reality is perceived as false. Skeptical of this version of modernist uh, embrace of art as the only solution, and hyper-aware of all the artifices of genre and form, but nevertheless seeking new means of creating the real. In 61, he gives us an example uh, that I think really illustrates the point that he's going for here. The subtitle of Douglas Copeland's Generation X is Tales for an Accelerated Culture, but the front of the book carries a blurb announcing that it's a novel. Is the book a collection of stories or a novel, nonfiction or fiction? Graphic statistics and mock sociological definitions complete as marginalia, uh, compete as marginalia with the principal text, which consists of tales only loosely connected by the same cast of characters, but very tightly organized around the inability of any of the characters to feel really anything. A mixture of nonfiction and fiction, information crowding out imagination in Generation X embodies the idea that these characters, bombarded by mall culture and mass culture, feel by mall culture and mass media, feel they have mick lives rather than lives. And this is really an image for uh, what Shields is, is characterizing as the condition here, this mixture of nonfiction and fiction as a way to, to deal with this the mick life situation. All right, so in 70, and there's a, this recognition that our lives aren't prepackaged along narrative lines, and therefore by its very nature reality-based art under-processed and overproduced, splinters and explodes. Uh, so it's really the fragmentation, which would be seen as, as really anti-realist in a literary sense, uh, is really the way to represent how our lives feel today. And so this is where he introduces uh, the influence of the internet. So uh, in 74, a regime 
of superabundant free copies, uh, which are the result of uh, superabundant free copies being the result of how computers uh, transfer information. Uh, Lessig talked about this uh, at length in, in that video that, that we watched at the beginning of the class. So in a regime of superabundant free copies, copies are no longer the basis of wealth. Now, representation, re now relationships, links, connection, and sharing are. Value has shifted away from a copy toward the many ways to recall, annotate, personalize, edit, authenticate, display, mark, transfer, and engage work. Art is a conversation, not a patent office. The citation of sources belongs to the realms of journalism and scholarship, not art. Reality can't be copyrighted. Which is a really interesting claim in thinking about uh, what DJ Spooky is talking about, this uh, multiplex, con multiplex consciousness where there's this stream of media filling our reality at any one time, uh, and the idea that if that is in the reality of our experience, then how could it be copyrighted? So uh, in 75, what is this technology telling us, this technology of the internet? Copies don't count anymore. Copies of isolated books bound between inert covers soon won't mean much. Copies of their text, however, will gain meaning as they multiply by the millions and are flung around the world, indexed and copied again. What counts are the ways in which these common copies of creative work can be linked, manipulated, tagged, highlighted, bookmarked, translated, and livened by other media, and sewn together in the universal library. Which is a really interesting take that the, uh, co where copying and no longer becomes the, the basis of value is now the freedom of the copy, not being able to hold the copy, but be able to connect it and put it anywhere. So what does this have to do with Remix? Or we, it should be clear now that we're moving towards Remix. Uh, but he gives us this Trials by Google chapter in the middle. Uh, and this is one of the places where he's trying to define uh, this, this sense of reality hunger. And so uh, in 90, oh, how Americans gnash our teeth in bitter anger when we discover the riveting truth that also played like a Sunday matinee was actually just a Sunday matinee. And in this section, he talks uh, about a set of uh, memoirs that came out uh, all around the same period that, that turned out to have been fabricated, at least large portions of it fabricated. Uh, the one he's, he spends some time on, and the, and the only one that I really recognize is the one by uh, Stephen Frey, which is the, uh, uh, oh, what's it, Million Little Pieces, uh, which was a Oprah's book, club book, and he, Oprah had, her, had Frey on talk about it, and they talked about how his life was an inspiration and all that, and then they found out that he made up most of it, and they brought him back on to apologize. So it was kind of a big public scandal. Uh, so in 92, when Frey and, and these others uh, wrote their books, of course they made things up. Who doesn't? Uh, each one said, sure, call it a novel, call it a memoir. Who's going to care? I don't want to defend Frey per se. He's a terrible writer. Uh, but the very nearly pornographic obsession with his and similar cases reveals the degree of nervousness on the topic. The huge loud roar as it turns, as it returns again and again has to do with the culture being embarrassed at how much it wants the frame of reality within that frame great drama. So it, the outrage that a writer would have made something up really indicates that this you know, reality hunger, this desire for something uh, to be real. So in 125, uh, another one of these, Running With Scissors, which was later made into a movie. Uh, after his family and psychiatrist sued for defamation, claiming that much of his depiction of them in his memoir, Running With Scissors, was invented or exaggerated, Augustine Burroughs agreed not to refer to his book as a memoir in the author's note. It would simply be a book, identified as neither fiction or nonfiction. Burroughs' other brother, John Elder Robson, wrote a memoir, Look, in me, Look Me in the Eye, in which their father is portrayed as a very different kind of person. Uh, and so you can see in, the, in this uh, section where he's talking about these uh, non-fictions that turned out to be fictions that uh, there's something here that he really admires, that he thinks is a really valuable approach. So in 159 it says, reality-based art is a metaphor for the fact that this is all there is, there ain't no more. Uh, and so he talks about the condition of mimesis now, or representation now, in, 185, in 184. An awful lot of fiction is immensely autobiographical. A lot of nonfiction is highly imagined. Uh, we dream ourselves awake every minute of the day. Fiction, nonfiction is an utterly useless distinction. And 195, uh, you adulterate the truth as you write. There isn't any pretense that you try to arrive at the literal truth. And the only consolation when you confess, and the only, the only consolation, 
<laughs> and the only consolation when you confess to the, this flaw is that you seek to arrive at a poetic truth which can be uh, reached only through fabrication, imagination, and stylization. What I'm striving for is authenticity. None of it is real. So again, where is Remix in this? And so he's going to bring all of this back to, to Remix as a kind of important concept uh, in this uh, particular situation. Uh, given the place where we are in uh, the, the age of the internet and the freely available copy, the uh, ubiquity of mass media to the point that uh, there's all sorts of communication around us all the time, uh, and also the state of uh, uh, literature uh, at the time. Right. So 140 says, the mimetic function in art hasn't so much declined as mutated. The tools of metaphor have expanded. As the culture becomes more saturated by different media, artists can use larger and larger chunks of culture to communicate. Warhol's Marilyn, <laughs> Marilyn Monroe uh, silk screens and his double Elvis work as metaphors because their images are so common in the culture that they can be used as shorthand uh, as other generations would have used, say, the sea. Uh, Marilyn and Elvis are just as much a part of the natural world as the ocean and the Greek god are. Anything that exists in culture is fair game to assimilate into a new work, and having pre-existing media of some kind in the new piece is thrilling in a way that fiction can't be. And then 242, our culture is obsessed with real events because we experience hardly any. Which I think is a really interesting uh, uh, place to enter into this. How do you represent something real when uh, so much of reality is this kind of uh, fabricated uh, representations of mass culture or uh, commodities or advertising or all of this kind of stuff. You know, basically what you do is you sample. So Remix. So he begins this, this section on uh, hip-hop uh, with three famous quotes from famous artists about uh, art basically being plagiarism. Uh, then on 281, he says, Just as the letters of our language are metaphors for specific sounds, and words are metaphors for specific ideas, shards of culture itself now form a kind of language that most everyone knows how to speak. Artists don't have to spell things out. It's much faster to go straight to the existing material. Film footage, library research, wet newspapers, vinyl records, etc. It's the artist's job to mix, edit the fragments together, and if needed, generate original fragments to fill in the gaps. The idea of shards of culture as, as the bigger chunks connected with, from sounds to words to these shards, these big chunks of culture that can stand in for things. It's a kind of shorthand. So in 288, uh, I really like this as, a, as an interesting idea of, of what it's like to be an artist in, the, in this period of ubiquitous media. So cultural and commercial languages invade us 24-7. That slogan I just heard on the TV commercial, I can't get that out of my head. That melody from the theme song into the syndicated sitcom arrives at 7 every night. We're colonized by this stuff. It invades our lives and our lexicon. This may be of no consequence to the average media consumer, but it spells trouble for the artist. There's now a slogan, a melody, a raw block, a raw building block of art living in his brain that he doesn't own and can't use. Now, which then leads to the next one, the suggestion that uh, all of culture is an appropriation game. So not not that it's in your head and you can't use it, but you got to figure out how to use it right. And then it comes to a section on reality TV. And so again, we're, we're sort of oscillating back and forth between this question of what counts as real when the, the fiction and the nonfiction is so inter intertwined, uh, especially in the contemporary period. What do you do with these chunks of of culture uh, that we have all around us. So the reality TV section, uh, he's going to take reality TV as a kind of uh, example, almost, of what the artist should be trying to do. So in 304, I like to see how reality shows are put together, especially the way in which the shows are a hybrid mutant of documentary game shows and the soaps. And the producers have no problem blurring the lines between these three types of shows. They take what works and discard the rest. And then the, in the next section, 305, my big picture philosophy is that with shows like this, I don't think our viewers necessarily differentiate between what's scripted and what's not. Our primary goal is to make a show that's compelling. And this is obviously from someone who produces a 
uh, reality TV show. The idea is not to worry so much about what you're mixing together. Is it true? Is it false? Is it something you're quoting or is it something original? How original is it? All that stuff. Just make something compelling. So then at 3.30 he, he takes remix and sampling as a kind of metaphor for all kinds of work or all kinds of art. And 3.30, everything I write I believe instinctively is to some extent collage. Meaning ultimately is a matter of adjacent data. And then 3.55 uh, is a quote from Emerson that is also quoted in DJ Spooky that, that really continues this idea. Our debt to, to, to tradition through reading and conversation is so massive, our protests so rare and insignificant, in this commonly on the ground of other reading and hearing, that in a large sense one would say there is no pure originality. All minds quote, old and new make the warp and wolf of every moment. There is no thread that is not a twist of two strands. By necessity, by proclivity, and by delight we all quote, uh, it is as difficult to appropriate the thoughts of others as it is to invent. And so I, I'd like to end on these because they really speak to the kind of work that you're going to be doing in your remix project. Making meaning from adjacent data, from putting two data sources next to each other. And then this difficulty of trying to appropriate the thoughts of others. So the remix project is going to be uh, your last project for the course, and so you basically have two weeks to be thinking about it and put it together. So this semester you've read a great deal about the theoretical aesthetic and social significance of remix. So for your final project, you're asked to engage in remix practices yourself in a way that embodies what you've learned. So the subject matter is up to you. You can um, make a remix about pretty much anything you want. Uh, and the uh, material and the object you make are up to you as well. So uh, you can make a something that's just a video that's all video clips you make something that's uh, a slideshow of text and images you can do something that's all text like uh, David Shields did you can do some weird hybrid that's video images text web pages whatever it happens to be uh, it's your choice I, I'm interested to see how you how you decide to uh, attack this project uh, and make it your own no bonus points for doing something that's super media heavy. Doing something all text is just as valuable as doing something uh, that is, you know, <laughs> all uh, video and interactive light laser light shows or anything. So the only requirements are that you build an argument. So it's not just make some kind of cool remix or something that you think sounds good or whatever. It's, it has to say something. It has to make some kind of argument. And then the second requirement is that you not use any original content. So I don't want you to, uh, as Shield said, write, st write the original stuff to fill in the gaps. Uh, I want you to use all remix because it's, it's actually really difficult to make an argument from all of someone else's words. So along with your project, you're going to do two other documents. One is going to be a list of sources that you've used while making the project. Uh, like I said, if you look at the end of Shields, he has to provide a listing of well, where he got everything. Uh, even if he doesn't include it in uh, inline citation. Uh, so you don't have to do inline citation either, but please do submit also as a part of this project a list of all the sources that you used. Uh, then the second thing I'm going to ask you to do is a 500 word reflection that discusses what you did, how you did it, and why it's relevant to our class. So this is your opportunity to explain to me in plain language uh, what you were trying to accomplish. Part of the reason why I include this is because I want to give you an opportunity to uh, direct me so uh, in the event that maybe you I didn't see what you were trying to go for in your remix you have this document that that tells me exactly what you're trying for so I can you can shape my perspective or direct me a little bit so you're going to submit your remix and the two accompanying documents by uploading them to the week 8 folder on Google Drive by Sunday at 10 p.m. on July 13th again that's not this Sunday it's the following Sunday not this coming Sunday but the following Sunday uh, and this is your final project. It's worth 15% of your final grade. Along with that, your post for this week is to write a proposal for your upcoming remix project. So the project asks you uh, to compose an argument by sampling already existing sources. And so this week, in anticipation of that, I'd like you to post to the uh, Google Plus what you expect to do or what you think you're going to do. Uh, so your post is going to answer three questions. Uh, what do you plan to do? How do you plan to do it? 
and why is the project you're envisioning relevant to the course conversation. So basically the same three things you're going to write in your, uh, re your review uh, that you turn in with your, your final project you're going to do here in this proposal. Now, what the project you propose is not a commitment. If it turns out that you start doing it and you don't like it or you have a different idea, that's fine. Uh, but I wanted to give, an op give you an opportunity to post to the website and get some feedback uh, from the rest of the class on the project that you're doing. So to the best of your ability, write what you think it is you want to do uh, in your Remix project. And you know, we, uh, we as your classmates and learning community will respond uh, hopefully not only with suggestions on how to make your remix better, but we may know some sources uh, that you might not that may be relevant. Maybe we've got a CD that you want to listen to or a movie that you could go for a clip or an essay that you could find a good quotation from, something like that. So hopefully um, we'll be able to crowdsource a little bit of each other's projects in this way. But again, it's not a commitment, so if you want to do something else, if you change your mind, that's cool. So again, your task for week seven, uh, please read Shields, uh, Reality Hunger, uh, through page 125 at least, uh, then uh, post your proposal for your Remix project, uh, do your usual discussion, and then uh, start looking for, forward to your Remix project next week. It's a good idea to start collecting sources early as it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you a while to get enough material to do something substantial. So start looking around for the stuff you want to do. And that's it for this week. Post any questions you have in Google+, and I'll see you all online.